to know like what KPHP is, you know, where it came from, and uh, and you know, so that sort of helps us know where we're going too. Uh, I think a lot of people understand that you know this was kind of a Ruby on Rails spin-off in some ways, and, and uh, but it's evolved into its own its, its own framework now. It's got its own features. It's got things that you know make it different from a lot of other frameworks out there. Uh, but April 2005, Cake 0 0.2 uh, Simple MVC was released by Michael. Yeah. And uh, anyway, Michael is a, you know, he was a young developer. Uh, he, he actually came out and said right away that he wanted to steal some of the stuff from Rails. And that was his goal from, from the start. He liked a lot of the ideas in there, but he really felt like he could do the same things in PHP that people were doing in Rails. Um, so he set out to do that. And he put together the simple framework, and, and he released it. MVC uh, uh, public domain, and um, the models weren't really connected up. You had to you had to create your own instances of models, and, and uh, it was a really simple dispatcher. The controller actually had like a lot of view logic in it. Um, it had things like you know the breadcrumbs would be stored in the controller, um, and so it was it was a great start. And I think. Um, that's what, uh, oh, that's too early. Um, that's what led Larry to pick it up. So Larry s saw it um, at this point and said, <laughs> I really like what, what's going on here. Um, I was, you know, he was sort of developing something at the same time that was really similar. And he said, well, let's start an open source project. And uh, you know, let's, let's really see what we can do with this framework. So Larry set up the Subversion site, and, uh, you know, after Mike Flick set up the Google group, and they they were developing under uh, you know Larry's domain at that time, which was Nextro, uh, and he he had all the Subversion. He convinced the guys who used Subversion they hadn't really done that before, um, and and so this was you know this was the start of an open source project, uh, uh, one that's grown into you know a developer group of 7,600. They brought together all of us today. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's been a lot of applications written on Cake now, and I think it's pretty amazing that um, just two and a half years ago this is when it all started. Uh, so now we can see this July two, 2005. Somebody's messaging. PHP.org goes live. So this this is when, you know, this is when it really became. You know what it is today. I think in, in a lot of ways, in terms of the foundation of the project, and it you know, moved away from just a, a simple you know project that might be around for a little while that had about 50 developers that were really intrigued by it and, and really interested in in the whole concept of a, of an MVC at the time to help them organize their code. And this is when. Uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot more recognition started to come to KPHP as well. Um, so that brought in a lot more developers. Shortly after, Michael decided that he was going to lead the project. At the time, he said, "I can't really imagine any successful project without a leader or visionary that everyone has to listen to." So clearly, he was admitting that he wasn't that guy. Um, he, you know, it's, it's often the person that starts a project, and you see this in business a lot person that is your CEO in the startup phase is not the CEO that carries you to the, you know, the growth phase, really. Um, so you need somebody, there's a startup mentality, there's somebody that takes an initiative, and then there's somebody that comes along and helps carry it through. There was, you can go back and read some of the things that they brought out from the SBN list, and, you know, Larry was just trying to organize a project at the time, and uh, Michael liked to do his own thing, just like he did in the startup <laughs> phase. Uh, and he went off and actually started up two more frameworks. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see the personalities and to see how a project grows and how it evolves. Um, so August 25th, 2005, Nate gets a sandbox. <laughs> Yeah, I went back into the timeline. I saw it when Larry uh, made Nate's sandbox, and uh, and that was that was pretty cool. And like the first 
thing that Nate did was like a little patch for something, and you know, and then he fixed like the CSS tag helper, and, and uh, you know, obviously Nate's come a long way since then, <laughs> and uh, and I think you know the whole project has, um, yeah, so am I, because I'm next. September 5th, 2005, I made my first post to the, to the mailing list, to the Google group. And, uh, woo, woo, yeah. um, it, I, I had actually written something called R.D. Baker, which was uh, the, the Bake script at the time had sort of had fallen out, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't in line with the latest code, so there wasn't really any way to do any code generation. Uh, but it was very clear that code generation was simple and possible and, and something that was really <coughs> beneficial to the framework. Um, so I made a little PHP script that would generate the classes and it was web-based and a lot of people liked it at the time and uh, Brago, who was one of the other core developers at the time and, and really involved in that early stage of the, of the project, um, taking over and, and taking over some of the project management roles uh, while Larry concentrated more on the development. Um, he was like, oh, well, you know, that's kind of cool. We should do something like that. And of course, I was like, well, it's not really written in cake. You know, it's just plain PHP. I don't know if we want to do that. But some of that code did end up making its way into uh, Bake. And I think uh, it's, it's been pretty cool. And then on October 4th, um, PHP Nut Larry announced the new project manager. And that would be. <laughs> um, and this was, it was a big, you know, it was a big step for me. I think it was a big step for the project. It was something that Larry and I, we, you know, we met each other on IRC, never seen each other face to face. Uh, he called me up one day and he, he said, you know, we don't really have this leader type guy, you know, that can organize his people. And, you know, I've got a vision and, and you know, Brago's got a vision, and Nate's got a vision, and we kind of need to, you know, bring all this stuff together. So we need somebody that can help organize us and, and do that. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, I was really excited to do it, and I think um, it's just been a lot of fun, you know, since then. And uh, to have everybody here at the conference really, you know, really makes it all uh, worthwhile to me. I mean, that's two years. Two years of hard, hard work, hard development, and uh, you know I think we've come a long way. So, what made me, you know, a, a person that was, you know, suitable for a project manager role? I think, um, and and why, you know, why can I help steer this project in the in the right direction? I think having a project manager that can, you know, that can help bring all these different minds together, have the patience to, uh, you know, to take. Different people's philosophies and trying to and, and trying to make those mesh into a cohesive framework. Um, you know, it takes it takes a certain person to really want to do that. Actually, sometimes I question if I'm just I'm crazy. Um, so, first, some history and philosophy. That's what I studied in college. Uh, I wasn't a programmer. Didn't do a CS degree or anything like that. Programming was something uh, that I had done as a kid and I was interested in, but. Um, and I was always I was always comfortable with computers, but it wasn't something that I, I went right after in college, like a lot of a lot of kids do. I studied history and philosophy, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share a little bit of the history of the project with you guys too, because I think it really matters. Um, and the philosophy part, I think it'll come out a little bit later in the presentation as well. Um, then I was an internet noob. I, you know, I think uh, this was. This was 1998, and uh, the internet was getting popular. You know, there was a lot of money being thrown around, and it was all very exciting. I had no clue what it was all about. Um, so after I got out of college, I just I became one of those one of those guys, and um, I you know read as much as I could, and I studied as much as I could, and I picked PHP after studying a whole bunch of other languages and and trying to get into them, and I picked PHP because easy to deploy, it was easy to pick up, and it had just a tremendous amount of, of utilities to it. Um, and you could see that the, this was when PHP was starting to grow at the time, and you could see that the community was really building up around, around it too. And so that was a huge reason for me to get involved in PHP, and I still think that's a huge reason to get involved in PHP today, 10 years later. Um, 
I went on to uh, you know, continue to work on the web, continue to grow my PHP skills, my programming skills, uh, mostly at the procedural level. And, uh, but I went to law school and business school at, at the same time. Um, I just I felt like I needed to have some more knowledge in that area, and so I wanted to uh, I wanted to expand it. And I think that the law and the, the logic skills and the analytical skills that I gained there have really uh, really helped my programming a lot. Um, and though I don't use the law stuff as much anymore, uh, you know I, I still think it was a great foundation, and it helps me understand a lot more about about what the framework can do uh, and what it should do because at the bottom of it all is a structure and we'll get into that a little bit too. So at the end of this, it <laughs> equals an open source project manager. Uh, somebody, I mean, I think I've, I've dedicated a, a lot of time to the project. I've, I've been behind uh, the development of pretty much all the sites that, uh, that the community uses now. Um, and you know, I've tried to share a lot of my code with the community as well. Uh, RD Open Source was one of the first uh, blogging systems that was released open source on Cake 0.10. And uh, though I didn't keep it up because I got too involved with the project, uh, you know, I think it's it's just it's been a good ride. Um, so why am I here? Uh, why you know, this is kind of like the why did I pick. PHP out of all the frameworks that were out there. Uh, what, did, what kind of potential did I see in a PHP framework that was this simple MVC back in April 2005 and by October it was actually about four different versions. Uh, there was a 0 0.91 dev and a, and a, and a 0 0.92 which some people wanted to take stable and then there was a 0 0.10 which was really a leap forward. And when I took over, when I talk, you know, talked to Larry about becoming a project manager, at the time we said, well, look, we've got to go with 0 0.10 because this is the <coughs> Forget about all the old, old stuff that had been written. And we may have lost some of the early adopters because of that. But as far as the framework goes, that was the right move because that really allowed us to create code that was easier to write and solved a lot, a lot more of our problems. Um, so, look at that. There you go, Felix. You missed it. Do it again. I'm going to do it again. Woo! Whoa. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> this is a little bit more on the philosophy side of things, but there was a, there's like a state of nature, and, and this is, you know, this is like way back. This is Hobbes. Um, ultimate freedom with all its benefits and costs. You, you've got everybody that wants to do their own thing. Everybody's always doing their own thing. They're always reinventing the wheel. They're always fighting with each other in a lot of different ways, and you end up with this solitary, poor, nasty Bruce and short life, according to Hobbes. Now that was, to me, kind of the way PHP development was before cake. It was just, you know, some people call it spaghetti, and I think it was just this anarchy in a lot of ways. Um, so what do you have to do? You have to create, in terms of government, you create a social contract. Uh, you organize to protect the freedom, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. I think that's kind of why we're all here. Um, and, and so you, you organize, you create a structure that everyone can agree to, and that everyone wants to buy by because that is actually going to protect your freedom even more than if you just had this anarchy. Um, and that's exactly what KP really is. We took you know, you take a, a structure like MVC, you put in some extensions and some ways to make it easier to to uh, to write your applications and to and to expand them and, and make it flexible, and and that's what a good structure is really all about. That's what a good government is all about, and I think those same principles apply here. Um, so it's kind of you know it's about bringing order to the chaos. Uh, to me, my development at the time before Cake was really chaotic. I, you know, if I needed a new feature, I'd throw in some functions in an include file, and I put it at the top of the whatever you know whatever other file I needed, and you know I try to organize it, but at the end of the day, it just it just becomes a mishmash. You end up doing things like f underscore or t underscore or something just to you know sort of organize all of your functions together and. 
and when I saw cake, and I even I saw the beginnings of cake, and, and how the classes were organized, it just to me it just made a lot of sense, and I think it does to everybody here too. Um, and that's that's why we're here, and that's why we've all agreed to organize this way, and that's why we can all simply share our code and operate under these these same principles, these these conventions. Um, so structure gives you more freedom. This is something that I think a lot of people really don't stop to think about. To, I, I, I met a guy a week ago, and he was saying, well, you know, KPHP's got this great structure, but, you know, it's, it limits you in, in all these ways, you know? And, it, and I was, I, I actually turned, turned to him, and I, and I had to giggle a little bit, and, and he's a professor at a university with a PhD in computer science. And, and I said, you've got to be kidding me. I, you know, the structure is, is what provides you the freedom to do what you really want to do. Once you stop having to think about how to organize yourself, and you can just think about how you want to run your application, run your life, you, you find that there's a lot more freedom, <coughs> freedom to it. And if you understand how the structure works and how to work within the structure, then you're, you're free to do anything you want to do. And I think in Cape PHP, we've really taken that philosophy to heart. And I think we've, we've really tried to do our best to provide you with the outs, provide developers with the outs to, to, to extend their applications, but at the same point, always knowing that there's this underlying architecture, this underlying framework that, that's going to keep things in place. Um, so, anyway, that's that's why I'm here. That's why I got involved with Cake. That's why I think Cake actually made me a happy programmer again, because I was in this state of nature, and I was battling with all these different forces, and I just, I didn't have what I needed, and I didn't have that structure, and, and that's what, you know, I'm really thankful for. Cake for that. Yeah. Um, so some of the basic principles that I try to apply uh, to the project itself, <coughs> I think it's important to understand that, especially from a project manager's role, how I want to try and organize things. Not always 100% successful doing it. There's a lot of different forces still pulling me in a lot of different directions. Um, but I try and live by these principles. I think that they that you know we all should try to do this too. Um, but to me, the code comes first. We, we try and put out the best possible code that we can first because that's really what we're after. We're after the best code. We're after building a framework that makes your life's coding easier. Um, and so that's why it does have to come first. And if that means that you've got to dig into it a little bit to see what's going on, well, I'd rather spend four hours making the logic seem a lot more clear and making functions seem a lot more clear and spend the time on the naming than sit there and spend four hours documenting, you know, a semicolon. You know, I mean, that's, to me, I think you can look at the code in Cake now and you can really understand what's going on underneath the hood. And I think that it makes all of us better programmers and it makes the framework better because it's forcing everybody to become a better programmer. And so that's why we really focus on the code first. And I think that everybody that's here, you know, we see on the mailing list a lot, and I was talking to Tino, and, and he was saying, well, there's noise on the mailing list now, and everybody demanding documentation, demanding documentation. But to me, the people that are here to, today and, and, and for the next three days are the people that are really driving this framework forward with us. And they're a huge part of it. And I think it's, it just makes it a great, great time. Um, we implement the features we need. Uh, this is, I think we all, we're all trying to do this. Uh, I think everybody has an application that they need a, sp a particular feature for, and they say, you know, write an enhancement ticket and say, ah, oh, well, this would be neat if we could do that. And sometimes it is something that we need, and that's, you know, that's a, a you know, just a great contribution. What would be even better is to actually implement the feature, not just ask for it, but to actually implement it with the test case. <laughs> Uh, but um, you know, we get there's a. If you go on the track site, you'll see still 100 enhancement tickets left open for 1.2. And the bottom line is, three developers. It's just it's not going to happen overnight. 
we need everybody's help. If there's a feature that somebody needs, then they need to get into the code, they need to figure out how to, how to implement that feature, submit a patch, and you know, the more somebody does that, the better off we all are, and you know, the, the, the bigger the team grows. And as the team grows, the, the framework grows. Um, and, and, and the reach of Cake grows. And I think that's something that we're also all here for, is we wanna show people that this structure, this way of organizing ourselves, is a, is a really valuable way to do it. And we wanna share that with other people. That's one of the things that I wanna share with you guys. And so, I think that, you know, if we could all <coughs> take a step back and, and do some of that, it would be, it would be amazing. Uh, release early, release often. We're also not so good at this sometimes, but we try really hard. Uh, a lot of things get in the way, um, but, you know, and some of it is the tickets and the features and <coughs> things like that, that that we could use a little bit more help with, but this is, I think, a goal that we all have. I think everybody sort of shares this goal. It's kind of the agile goal, um, and, uh, you know, I can, there's not really much time spent on that. Make it work, make it work better. This is uh, another one of Larry's tenants that uh, I learned from him, um, and it's been great working with him because of a lot of the things that he's taught me. But one of the things that we do try and do, and, and you can see it in the branch, is we try, and Nate's really good at this. <laughs> he sort of makes it work. <laughs> and then I sort of come along and make it work better. Um, and, <laughs> and, vice <laughs> and vice versa. And vice versa, of course. Probably <laughs> more often vice versa. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Put my foot in everybody's But in any case, th I think this is something that, you know, we all try and, and do in our applications as well. But at the same time, I, I don't think that you can overlook the make it work better part. It's really important to go back and 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 make sure that happens sooner rather than later because it's easy to leave something for later and it's harder to stick with it, iterate through it, and really solve the problem. Timeline's bad. <laughs> Stability's good. Uh, th this is kind of like, I mean, I was reading an article about agile software development and, and this guy that was working at Google and how they don't set deadlines for anything. Um, they have goals. That doesn't mean that they don't have goals. They don't have goals that they set for themselves. But they try and apply this, this same open source philosophy because it really it is. I mean, in the open source world, rarely do people set timelines on when something's going to come out. And I think, you know, we've obviously seen that with Kate over the last year <laughs> where we released a, a dev release of 1.2 Christmas. 06, and uh, and here we are, 08, and uh, we're in beta. Uh, so it's not that we haven't been working hard on it. It's not that there haven't been a lot of features implemented. I mean, I think you can look at the number of change sets that's happened since then, and that's where the stability is good part comes in, because we really do try and keep the branch, the latest code, stable. We're developing on that. We build applications ourselves, and and and. We like it if, especially the people that are here, come along with us for the ride and help us out, test the code, figure out what's going wrong, and and submit patches back, and test cases. Uh, and uh, but we do try and keep the branch stable, and I think that there's been a lot of people that have actually put out production applications on the branch code, and to me that's you know you can have all the timelines you want, but if you keep your code stable and like Travis, you know, would like to see if we can always have the green bar anytime there's a commit going across the test suite, then, you know, it's good. And honestly, we don't need a deadline. Okay. So, have, oh man, this one doesn't have it. Thanks. Um, ha having fun with the team. Um, organizing a team is something, you know, that is, a, is certainly a challenge. Um, especially when it's an open source team and there's people working for different companies <coughs> doing different things and you're all working for different companies doing different things, building different applications that have different requirements and to see the breadth that Cape can cover is pretty amazing too. But to organize a team of really diverse individuals, I try and follow this consensus-driven development um, 
where at best we can all agree on what absolutely has to do has to go into the core. Um, doesn't always happen. Sometimes there's some head banging, and you know, sometimes there's some roughing up. But uh, at the end of the day, we come back, and and everyone does agree what's been in there. I think it's a testament to our ability to reach consensus in our development. The fact that we've been together for this long, Larry, Nate, myself, John, uh, eighty-seven, Andy, um, you know, have been around for a long time. And you know more than two years, and uh, that that says something. It, it, it says something not just about the code, but about how the project is run and how how things get developed. Uh, part of that too is to challenge and incentivize and develop. You know, some some people. Uh, Nate, Nate's going to give a talk on reasons why people contribute to open source, um, and you know, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And I think that the challenge and the incentive to really share something with everybody, uh, at least that's what I try and do. And I try and find places where people, when they do want to get involved, don't just stick them off in a corner and say, hey, go do this. You know, it's, I want to find out what really excites people about the core. And it's, it's interesting when somebody says, hey, I want to come work on the core. And I go, well, what do you want to work on? You know, what, what, what drives you? What's the incentive? What's the challenge for you to work on the core? You know, is it an application that is going to support the community? Or is it testing? Or is it, you know, some new feature that you want to implement? I mean, those are all things that drive us to contribute. And those are things that I want to, I try and bring out in the team. Be polite. Uh, it's hard to do this sometimes too, especially when you've been working with the same guys for a long time. <laughs> um, you know, they, you get to know them really well, and uh, and it's not always easy to be polite. But it's something that I want to do a better job at, and I think we should all do a better job at. Whichever company we're at, whatever environment we're in, it's from the top down. And <clears throat> if the top is is polite to everybody. And, and treats everyone with respect, then not only are they gonna get respect, but the whole team is gonna feel as if they want to be part of it. And I, I, I don't think we can, we can really stress that enough because it's so easy when you get caught up in a deadline or when you get caught up in a, you know, some feature that isn't being implemented the right way and you, can, you just come off and you just start banging on the guy and telling him their code is no good and, and telling them that you know they need to go back to to refactoring school, um, you know, that's it doesn't really get us anywhere at the end of the day. And it would be much better if we could all approach it and say, hey, look, maybe there's a better way to do this. You know, maybe you know it just challenges us all to do that and us all to question what it is that's actually wrong with the code because we do have an emotional response when we see some code that we don't think is right. We look at it and we go. Wait a second. That's totally illogical. How could you possibly want to write something? We step back for a second, try and understand their perspective, and and you might realize that there was actually a really good idea. Um, design, test, review, document. Design. I mean, we we design. It's it's usually you know in the dev channel, but we you know we talk about a feature that we want to implement. Uh, we, we bounce ideas back and forth. Sometimes it just somebody just goes and implements something. Sometimes, and, and that's a way to show design as well. I think is is provide that that proof of concept, uh, and then and then you can talk about it. But other times, you know, we've we've talked about something, you know, feature like schema, for instance, or the, even the console. Uh, we've talked about these things before we've even written a line of code, uh, and and we do try and do that testing. Obviously, it's something we need to do a better job at. It's something that wasn't really around um, since the beginning. Even though Larry did say back in 2005, I found a Google group post about writing test cases. Um, but we're, we're trying to get more test cases. I think that when you, when you first create your design, if you can test it next, um, and then you can review that, <coughs> review the code that you write to pass your test, and then, and then you can document it once it's been implemented. Uh, that's that's how I kind of 
would like to see things things done within the team. I think it's a good way for, for a lot of teams to be run. Contribute to society. So this brings us back to a few slides before where we've all shared this social contract. We're, we're a KPHP society, you know. We, we have these common goals. And just like in real life, just like when we go outside the door, there's different ways that people contribute to society. Uh, and we've got that in our little microcosm as well. And I'd like to share a few of <coughs> the ways people contribute. One is really not much effort. I call it no effort. Um, these are the, you know, they, they post a ticket, almost no explanation. It's a one-liner. There's six of them in the track site right now that I saw last night. Um, no steps to duplicate the problem. <coughs> And it's not even properly categorized. You know, they left the default things in there. We don't know what version they're on. We don't know what version of PHP they're on. This is, these are not the people that really help us, you know, get where we want to go. These aren't the people that make our society a better place. Um, these are the guys that are just, you know, in a lot of ways, I think, just complaining about something not working. Not taking the effort to, to make a difference themselves. Then there's people that put in some effort. They, they you know, explain as best they can what the problem is with the ticket. They categorize it. Maybe they even give some code to reproduce there. Uh, it's, it's still valuable to us in a lot of cases. Um, it's, you know, especially if it's a simple problem, a lot of times that's all, you know, that's all we need. And that's plenty of a contribution. And I think, you know, we've got plenty of examples of, of, of those out there, too. Uh, but it's really not, not necessarily the ideal way to do it. Even if it's a one-liner fix, it'd be nice to just be able to copy and paste a diff and throw it in there, you know. Um, the attempted effort. So this is the well-explained ticket with a patch. Uh, so somebody wants to get involved wants to contribute back, wants to take some steps, I think it's valiant. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, you know, maybe something that they shouldn't have done, and maybe they should have just put in some effort, and then they wouldn't, you know, feel bad if their patch isn't accepted or something like that. But, you know, it's still, even, even a patch that we don't apply is still a valuable patch in my opinion. Um, it's still something that we can look at and we can say, hey, well, you know, they took the effort to understand the problem. And, you know, we can see where they're going with this. And it might not be the exact place to do it because they don't understand all the internals of the core. But, um... <laughs> too late. I know. Uh, okay. Anyway, I don't need to go into that too much. Then there's the good effort. So, I, I like this one. You know, I like this one a lot. Uh, Well-explained ticket, has a test case, gets us right to where we need to be. Um, and, and once we can put that test case in, we can, we can create the, the, the code that's going to solve the problem. And that's, that's a worthwhile effort. I think it's worthwhile to take the time. It's, it's more worthwhile to take the time to write the test case than it is to go searching through the core for the problem. Instead, write a test case that reproduces the problem. And if it's hard to write a test case to reproduce the problem, jump in IRC. Maybe you go to the Google group if you don't have time for that. I, I know everyone's time is, is limited. My time is limited. And I want to make sure that Cake is the best framework for everybody. And I think if everybody just puts in a little bit of effort, a good amount of effort, then it really will be a lot better for everyone. Um, and, it, and it doesn't take that much. It really doesn't take that much. It takes a little bit to learn how the test suite works. It takes a little bit to learn how to write the test case, but there's a lot of test cases now out there, a lot of really good examples of how you can do it in all facets of the framework, from the model to the view to the controller. Component loading, load, you know, helper loading, all that stuff has coverage now. All that stuff you know, is, is a really good example to, uh, to use. And then there's the ultimate effort, <laughs> and that's a test case and a patch uh, that you know, obviously, you write the test case, you know there's a problem, you can duplicate the problem, it's easy to show, and then it's also easy to find the patch. And I think that's pretty clear that, that that's, 
that's the ultimate goal for, for everyone's contribution to society. Or cake. The code. What's important in the code? Um, I'm not even sure what's on this slide, actually. Um, oh yeah, stable branch. So this is kind of, this is more about how, how we release the code for everybody. Uh, so that everybody understands what we're working with. And, and honestly, this, I'm going to go through this one pretty quickly because I think that everybody likes to work off of SVN or, you know, could be working off, off of SVN really easily. Stable branch, no worries. I mean, Tim, Timo was talking about this morning how he's got an application that he's been working on for a year. He's still working on 1.1, 1, 1 .1, hasn't put that much time into 1.2. Part of the reason why it's here is to learn a little bit more about 1.2, I think, and what he's been missing over the last year. Because uh, it's a lot. Uh, but the stable branch really shouldn't have too many worries. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's the right, right point for development for a lot of people. It's a good place for a lot of people to start and try things out because they're not going to have the same headaches that you might have with the branch, which isn't perfectly stable, although relatively. The nightly builds. That's really just a way to try out the latest goodies, um, some of the latest features that get in there. We have a problem with the nightly builds right now, which I'm hoping is, should be fixed. I've been saying that for a while. But uh, in any case, I think, like I said, most of us use SVN. One of the things that I want to get into more is uh, development trunk is kind of like the leading edge. I'd like to actually try, and this is part of that release early release often for me, is I really would like to try and merge the trunk on a much more regular basis, almost a weekly basis. That, you know, if we fix 10 tickets in a week or 12 tickets in a week, that we can actually take the time, merge it to the trunk, <clears throat> It's out there for everybody. It's more stable than the branch. So if you're running 1.2, for instance, in production, um, you can trust that this is a little bit more stable than the branch might be, which is under more constant development. And this is kind of this is the leading edge. Um, and I and I would really like to try and get into this. I think this is also a great way to manage your own projects too. You know, and and I manage projects this way for clients. We we've got a, a trunk version. That's the one that gets out there. That's the one that they're seeing. Uh, that's the one that gets released often. Uh, and, and, the, and the branch code, they don't, they don't even really see. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think this is a good way to go. And then the, the branch is on the bleeding edge, obviously. A lot of people here probably know that. Uh, sometimes it hurts. And uh, actually, Felix even started a whole Google group about it. Um, and, you know, but that's development, you know, that's progress. There's going to be some bumps in the road in progress, and I think what's really important and what the takeaway here is, is that we're trying to keep it stable. We're, we're doing our best. Um, st stability is really important for us, and, and the more help we can get from everybody, uh, the better it's going to be. I got some cliches to remember. Um, I spoke to Marches about this, so he'll see it, and actually I think I threw one of his in here. Uh, which he used the other day, um, because I, I think you know cliches. Well, let's see, uh, cliches, a phrase or expression is according to Wikipedia. I should have put the uh, citation here. Uh, phrase or expression or idea that has been overused to the point of losing its intended force or novelty, especially when at some time it was considered distinctly forceful or novel. And I think that's the important part, of the second part of the statement, is that it was important at one point, it still is actually important, and it's just been overused. But we haven't really applied a lot of these to develop them, to software development. Um, and I think that, they, that there's a few that we could, and there's actually more than a few that we can apply. Mm -hmm. Measure twice, cut once. This is a cliche that you know, you use a lot in construction. Larry was involved in construction a lot. You know, there's no such thing as a board stretcher, okay? You, you can't make a board longer after you cut it. So, good thing about code is we can. Uh, the, the bad thing is, is that it takes more time. If, you know, it is, you know, in some ways you want to make it work and then go back and make it work better. But also, if you take the time to really think about the problem, in a couple of steps, sit back, and uh, then you end up writing cleaner code. 
And I think all too often, and uh, all too often we're just too eager to just jump right in. You know, and you see this a lot when new people pick up the framework too, is they just want to get right into the blog tutorial and they haven't really thought about the code behind it. And it's the same thing in, that, in any application. You want to think about the code that's going to be behind it. You want to think about the logic that's going to be behind it. Before you even sit down to write a piece of code, you've, you've thought about it in your head a couple of different times. And you have a really good idea of how you're going to go implement it. And you don't end up writing a caching thing that actually doubles the time of processing. You write it the first time, the right time. The devil's in the details. This is a, my homage to Chris, who I talked about this sort of part with. Um, and this is what he used in his, his last uh, blog post, uh, where he was having some, some trouble with, um, with the Postgres sequences. And um, it, it really is. It, it's, it, you know, one, one line of code in the wrong place, one variable in the wrong place, one check in the wrong place, um, too many checks in the wrong place. It, it's, Attention to detail is really important, I think, especially when we're dealing with Cape code, because it, it's so clean, it's so simple. Um, you can write an application with as few lines of code as possible, and that's really the ultimate goal. And, and what you want, to, what I try and do myself, is boil everything down to its essence, to the details, pay attention to those, and, and don't overlook those. That, that means no one curly brace out of line. You know, no one parentheses without a space before it, not in our standards. You know, everything, your, your, your approach to the code is, is you know, as, as close as you can possibly be to perfection. I mean, I, I, you know, that's what we're all trying to achieve with our applications. And I think if we're doing that, then at the end, we just have a, the main, maintenance becomes that much less. We have less code to worry about, and it's a lot cleaner to look at, and it's really a lot more fun to work with. And you know, to me, that's really important. I enjoy programming when I see a piece of really clean code, and I go, "Wow, man, we just, you know, that just solves three problems in like four lines of code, and you know, it's just it's super clean to look at. And every time you go back to it, you know exactly what it's doing because you spent extra time up front to pinpoint the exact details that you need. Oh, don't bite the hand that feeds you. <laughs> this one. Um, this one's for all the uh, naysayers out there, or all the, uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, but the, uh, the people that are more about complaining than they are about uh, helping. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we do this because we know people appreciate it. And the more people that show their appreciation, the more effort that we want to put into it. And I think that applies for everyone here, too. And, you know, I think it's just a really good thing to remember that there's people out there that are doing some work for you. We're all benefiting from this. And it goes back to that being polite part, too. That if you look at the whole Cake community as a team, then you should be polite throughout the whole Cake community. And there's no reason not to be. Because at, at some point, at, at some time, one of those people might be the one that's feeding you. Uh, and then think outside the box. I like this one. And I don't know how much time I've got, but uh, does anyone have a time check? Oh, wait, I do. I got five minutes. Uh, so, think outside the box a little bit. Oh, nope, not there yet. Uh, here we go. So, anyway, uh, here's my IRC. Here I had some few people talking to me when they're psychic. So, one guy came into IRC one day and he said, ah, I'm writing a bot. Would you be interested in it? And I said, uh, here I was going to implement the logging. I was sitting out there and I got distracted. Um, and he said, oh, I'm going to implement a bot in PHP. Would you guys be interested in using it for the channel? It does like tells and it does this and it does that. And I'm like, Oh yeah, cool. You, you know, you're ready to you use the console know. for that. You know, you're writing a, a shell for that. Um, and he's he's like, oh no, you don't, you don't need cake for that. And and I said, okay. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You don't. He had a PHP file with 800 lines of code in it. 
Um, you absolutely don't need KPHP for that. Um, I fully agree with it. But instead, I said, well, let me show you what we can do. Um, and, and so in about 30 minutes, I whipped up this uh, combination of this shell and task. And this, the IRC shell, super simple, right? Uh, it just has a bot task in it. You call, you know, I can go over here to terminal and I can call cake IRC. Uh, ideally this will work. Yeah, here we go. So this is running, this is running locally. Uh, it's going to sign into the uh, test, um, the test room. So I'm going to join the test room as well. There's, there's the Jibu bot, uh, which will eventually become a cake bot, I think. Uh, and this is the kind of thing where, you know, it is, I think, thinking outside the bo box a little bit because I sat down for a second and, and I did think about this before I even started coding. And I said, well, wait a second, you know, Felix wrote this great socket class and uh, contributed that. And what if the <coughs> bot task just extends that? And I can still load the bot task from the shell and, and I've got all the socket stuff I need right inside of, of my task. There's no reason why a task has to extend the shell. Uh, you can see I just wrote my own constructor, which you know calls the parent constructor of this and then gets a dispatch, which is going to get passed into the task by the, sh the uh, shell loader anyway. So and really all I needed was a dispatcher, and I can just override some of the methods that I need uh, <coughs> in, which is getting the input from, from the user, out, which obviously sends, sends out the strings, and then an error. And so that's really the basics of what the shell does anyway. It takes input, throws stuff out, and throws an error. Um, so what I did then was just had to figure out how to work with this connection, had to figure out how to join the IRC channel, get the last error from that, here, I mean, obviously when I'm using Parent Connect, that's from the socket class. Um, and, you know, I thought that this was kind of a really unique way in, uh, you know, what ended up being 293 lines to implement something with complete tells and I can end logging. Well, the logging I haven't fully done yet, but I can say, um, you know, tell Chiwu about Chiwu. Um, which is wonderful. Syntax error. So obviously I've got something wrong. But in any case, the idea is there. It was working at one point, so it was probably the changes that made last night to the you syntax error to the uh, task. What's that? You need a test for that error. Yeah. If somebody can figure out how we write the test for this, I would really appreciate that. Because um, I've been banging my head against the wall with this. Uh, let's see if I can... Uh, Cool. I'll remember KPHP. That work. And uh, let's see if I can tell Jibu about KPHP. Uh, oh no! Look, there it said Jibu about KPHP is cool. So I it did work. Uh, it all works just fine. Um, <laughs> I like that. So anyway, that's uh, that to me is thinking outside the box. I think it's a pretty decent example of it. And then I'm just going to go back to what's left um, for me for the next uh, little bit here. And uh, that's the cookbook. Uh, this is an application that Andy's been working really hard on. This is what's going to become the uh, manual, you know, the documentation. And right now it's open for everyone to contribute to, so it's very much like a wiki. It has revisions. Uh, John Psychic is going to be you know, reviewing those, editing them, posting them. Uh, it's a great place for people to start contributing to the documentation, and it's done a pretty good job, really good job of, of creating this application. Um, it's it uses the bakery account. <coughs> I created a plugin that um, that accesses the bakery. 
um, and uh, and so it uses the same bakery account um, if you have one or if you were able to activate it. Um, so that's you know hopefully that makes it easier to contribute and you know if you find use a useful function and, or if you if you want to you know put up an example of what you did something before then uh, I think this is going to make it really a lot easier to do that. Bakery 2.0, um, we're going to work, we're, we've been working on this a little bit as well. Um, and this is, you know, we've got our problems with the bakery, uh, something that Larry and I wrote uh, in about 23 hours. Um, and Mariano and some others have, have put a lot of effort into to maintain. Um, at this point, it was written on 1.2 def code, which obviously I think a lot of people know that that's changed a lot. Um, we can reduce a lot of what the bakery code is about. And so bakery 2.0 is going to be a rewrite in, in 1.2, pushing us towards stable 1.2. And uh, I think it's going to be a great resource. And if people want to get involved to help us do this, by all means, I would really appreciate it. I, I hang out in kphp bakery IRC channel. And uh, you know, I'd love to get more people involved in, in helping do this. I think it's a great experience. I'd be happy to you know work with anybody here on on, on building it. I think you learn a lot, and uh, I think it's a really worthwhile contribution uh, for everyone in the, in the community. And then uh, the Cake PHP in Action, the official guide. This is a book. Uh, it's going to be. Put out soon. The first six chapters are under review at the moment. Manning uh, Publishing is going to make these available, I think, to everyone for free or something like that. Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll be able to all pick those up and uh, and, and review them and see if we got any additions to make to them before the book goes to print. Uh, it's kind of like a preview release, and, and they have a long history of doing that. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to be involved with Manning. Um, it's it's coming along really well. It's got a really good personality. I think Cake's got a really good personality. I think everyone here does. It's what makes the Cake community, you know, special, uh, different, and uh, I think it's why we all got involved. And so I hope everyone checks that out. And uh, I think that's the end. Yep. So anyway, thank you. Anyone have?